Welcome to Dig Deep, the mining podcast. In this podcast, we go deep into mining news, hot topics, and live interviews with mining professionals and leading figures in the mining industry. Introducing your host, Rob Tyson, founder and director of Mining International and Mining International Executive, a leading global mining recruitment and headhunting agency. Hi, mine community. Welcome back to another episode of the Dig Deep, the Mining Podcast. And today's guest is John Cisse, who has two decades as a, in senior leadership experience in the mining industry, working for the likes of Weatherall International and Allied Gold Corp, uh, before becoming the CEO of Sierra Rotale Limited, uh, managing one of the largest natural rotile deposits in the world. Um, during John's career, he's operated in over 10 African countries, including Moles at De Beer and American Mineral Fields, which is now First Quantum. Um, John's currently the CEO of Ongo Polo uh, Mining and Processing Limited. Um, and today he's going to talk about a variety of subjects, um, including Namibia's recent decision to ban the export of processed ore, um, the country's mining policies, uh, the opportunity to develop local supply chains to improve uh, the sector's sustainability and impact, um, and why copper prices must maintain above $10,000 um, $10, uh, per tonne to ensure supplies meet demand by 2030 um, and government's role in ensuring this. So that's welcome, John, to the podcast. How are you doing, John? Very well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and no, I appreciate your time as well. Um, yeah, so as, obviously, as we always start these podcasts off, I just wondered if you can um, tell us a little bit about your career. As I mentioned, um, you work for uh, a variety of big companies and I suppose in the various various roles. So I just wondered if you can just tell us a little bit about uh, your career and your journey um, to sort of present day. Oh, thank you. Um, well, basically, I started my um, journey of a mining career with the Bears in London at the what was called the DTC. Um, started as a as a as a buyer and a management management trainee. After that, I then went to Congo, um, worked with um, uh, American Mineral Fields, as you mentioned earlier. Now, first quantum, looking at the Coalways, the tailings, Kapushi mines. Um, I then went to Sri just after the war. There, we then um, took acquisition of the Sierra Rutile, rebuilt it, listed it in London, and um, I became CEO of that in two thousand and eight. Um, we built a, what I thought was a really great country in, in West Africa, um, put it in Sri Lanka back on the map, making it a, a attractive destination for mining finance. Um, then we sold that to Iluka 2017. Um, then, yeah, found myself in Namibia to rebuild what is a very exciting prospect for us, a copper mine in the Ongopolo, which used to be a state-owned sort of mining company before. Um, we've got three different mines under the same term umbrella. You've got an open cash mine and an underground mine um, producing copper cathodes on one side and copper concentrate on the other. So it's uh, given where we are with the copper space at the moment, it's a very exciting space. Okay, great. I wonder if you can just tell us a little bit, obviously, more about your uh, current company that you're working for. And I'll go into some of the questions that I mentioned in the introduction. Yeah, so Angapolo, like I said, mentioned was um, is an old, you know, most in most, a lot of these African countries historically, there used to be state-owned mining companies that will do all of geological work and build all these uh, mining um, sites. And so we took over Angapolo um, about five years ago, um, we drilled the whole, uh, the main um, mine site, which is Chudi, to try and increase the mine life. Um, and the view has always been the world is going into a different direction. The EV space, electrification, um, climate change are going to be, uh, you know, um, significant in the future. And it's going to be a, a, a paradigm shift in terms of um, the, the relation between supply and demand in things like copper, lithium and others. So we took a long term view. And so we've been over the last four years steadily trying to build the company properly, um, trying to make sure that we get our green credentials right. And I know instinctively when people always hear mining, it doesn't quite correspond with climate change. But the critical thing to achieve the climate change ambition, you need mining to produce your copper, your lithium, and all of those things. And, and actually, mining's footprint 
it's not that huge compared to, to our day to day consumption. So, so we've we've done that. We've been trying to build the right team, and I'm, I'm very excited about the people I'm working with. I'm very excited about um, the Namibians that are working with us. Namibia is an excellent country in terms of um, the rule of law, in terms of the mining legislation, but it also has a history of mining. So you have a lot of local talent that you can utilize. And so we've been working hard to make sure um, we we employ the best. And hopefully by first quarter this year, we'll be in production with the copper cathode, which we used to produce at LME standard. Um, beneficiate it to as much as you can. The only thing you have to do with it after we're finished with it is, pick, is you know, stretch it to wire or make a couple, couple of pots or whatever you want to do with it. So yeah, it's just an exciting and prospect for us going forward. Good to hear. Um, how has the recent ban on the export of unprocessed ore uh, in, the, in the country affected the mining sector? Um, and what specific opportunities do you see emerging uh, as a result? I mean, I think the ban, it was, it was a specific kind of ore, not all kind of ore. It was more to do with your sort of EV battery kind of ore, like lithium. Um, and, I, and, I, and I understand um, why, in the sense that the governments always feel that they always transfer value outside. And so they want to retain more value, um, just not being a primary producer of ore, but also um, have factories being built. Yeah, uh, obviously there are logistical challenges. This so you can't do it overnight, but I think um, the government's intention is to really spread uh, the footprint of the wealth of mining in the country. So that's why they went for this, and so uh, it'll encourage uh, companies to to look at a, uh, sort of more of their chain being left in country before you can export out. Uh, and the, and the government is quite flexible and reasonable about, about it. You know they understand. You need to have the right infrastructure in place uh, in terms of power, roads, and everything else. And Namibia is very different to a lot of African countries, also specifically West African countries, that it has got a good infrastructure. It's got reliable power, although it gets a lot of its power from South Africa that has power issues, <laughs> but it's, they seem to sell enough to, to Namibia to keep it stable. Can you explain some of the, the key elements of N Namibia's mining policies um, that you believe could serve as a blueprint for other African countries, uh, s s uh, obviously seeking success uh, within the mining industry. Look, I think one of the advantages of Namibia, as compared to the other ones, it's got very transparent laws. And you know, as an investor, you always want your investment to be protected. So, you, fundamentally, you want the rule of law. Um, the court system works well. We've seen several cases where. Companies challenge a government decision um, and they go to court, and actually, companies win. You know, you don't always get that in a lot of countries. Let me I just say Africa, in a lot of countries, it's very difficult to, to take a government to court and actually win. And that, that I like about Namibia. I like the fact that not every company, there's no, there are discretionary investment incentives, but for, for most part, everything is transparent and it's in the book, in, in the finance. Uh, 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 agreements that you have. So you know what you're getting for, and it's predictable. I like that about it. Um, and also, uh, shockingly, you, you would have heard stories historically about things like VAT payments where companies are owed hundreds of millions uh, in VAT repayments that they never see. In Namibia, we don't have to get in touch with them. Every two months, you get your VAT back, which was shocking to me. You gotta, so, so there's predictability, there's transparency. Of course, every country has its challenges, but, you know, the power status work with you in terms of your power supply, power demand, and and also they're taking on board where you are in terms of your business case, in terms of your progress. So I, I, I'm quite happy working in, working in Namibia. Yeah. Um, what are some of the potential benefits in of developing, obviously, local supply chains within the Namibia mining industry? Um, and how can this contribute to uh, a greater sustainability and impact? As sort of um, investors or miners, we can't do mining like we did 100 years ago. The whole world is changing how it does things in so many areas of our lives in the sort of, let's call it, the so-called developed world. And I think, you know, in a lot of African countries, the aspiration is there that mining should change also, not only in terms of employing employment locally, but also 
skill development and technological sort of uh, um, advancement through the building of factories and everything else. Um, very, very qualified and competent Africans that have been all over the world, they can actually do this stuff. You know, it's, you know, well, some of it is complicated, but we, we think in terms of building a value chain and creating employment and creating that skill that, that can then sort of like um, uh, spread through the communities in other, in other serious areas. You've got to remember that in a lot of these rural communities, in terms of bringing in proper infrastructure, usually you need to have a host reason that will make that will make sense to make that economic development. And usually it's mining. And and the most for me, you know, sustainability, you know, you've got obviously got your environmental aspect to, of it, but also in terms of social cohesion and everything else, creating those real jobs, but the high skill jobs, very important, uh, and, and well paid jobs, you know, in, and so you and the great thing about places like Namibia, South Africa, to a certain extent, Botswana, is because of their history in mining, you got resident stuff. Now, I always believe in meshing cultures uh, because we all have so much to learn from each other in terms of how we manage and how we see things and how we appreciate and understand technology. But for the most part, you want to employ most of the, the local people as much as you can to give them that opportunity and, and widen your, your, your sort of um, footprint in a country. Why is it crucial for copper prices to remain above ten thousand uh, dollars per ton uh, in order to meet future demand by twenty thirty? <laughs> and what actions would you say uh, government should take uh, to maintain these prices? Well, two things there. Um, I think the, the market as a whole to 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 sort of narrow that deficit supply demand deficit um, needs a ten thousand dollar ton price um, because when you when you look at the length of time for exploration and, and, and capital build, most companies will, at, at this point in time, are waiting for that sustainable price uh, because that's where you can make that profit. And it's not a huge amount of profit, uh, but it's to be to be able to, when you think over the last year, the increases in all your inputs, you know, oil and everything else, uh, you need a $10,000 uh, price. Government can't really do much about that. And he says, apart from creating a stable, predictable environment, um, we we watch what's happened in South America recently, and that's also, you know, um, created some instability in the market, which, in a, in a bizarre way, sort of pushed the prices up a bit because everybody gets a bit panicky. But it takes about seven years to bring some of those mines to 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 production, and you know, to incentivize that investment. You need a strong copper price. And given all that's going on, and if the world, you know, sort of gets out of this sort of milieu of is it recession, is you know, is it growth that we're going through, which we as we speak to spoke to earlier, we hope that this year we'll get we'll get past that. I don't see any reason why copper should not be around the 10,000, 10, 5, 10 mark. I mean, right now with all the stability that going around it, it's it's you know, sort of put around age five. And I, in the first, uh, I think in the next quarter, we'll see probably go around to 9,000. What what needs to happen, uh, I suppose, in the environment um, to get that copper price up to 10,000 and above? Well, the fundamental thing is growth, economic, because copper pricing generally tends to track GDP growth. Um, but when we, we look at, you know, the... Um, the pronouncement by governments in terms of net zero and all of those things, the growth in the EV market, both in China, China being a huge consumer of copper, of course, um, and the EV market in, in Europe. So for all these countries to achieve their stated climate you know, um, agendas, um, that investment needs to go into the economy. There needs to be that growth. And, and, then, and we know for sure there is a shortage in the market. It will become, become more accentuated in the next three, four years. Uh, but to incentivize all of us to do more and expand more, we need that price to hike. But I, and I, I'm confident um, that, that that the price will go up because the, the major paradigm shift, uh, you know, that, as we talked about, is the is the EV revolution for us. Um, and that it has to happen. So copper will go up. I'm confident of that. Unless yeah. there's a massive recession and there's a third world war or something. You know, but you know, I don't think we're going to go to that space. How can the the global north transition away from uh, transitional resource acquisitions 
uh, instincts in Namibia and uh, obviously Africa as a whole. What benefits do you think this may bring to both regions? Look, I think, as we, we mentioned earlier, we can't keep doing things the, the old ways. Um, a lot of these resource-based countries are also looking at, thinking, well, why are we not at the table? Why are we just exporting all, all the wealth? And so they want to obviously retain as much of that as possible. I think there's a there's an opportunity for a real sustainable partnership there. Um, some of the concerns we used to have in terms of African mining, I don't think are valid in a lot of countries. I understand in other places, um, you know, looking at things like instability, corruption, or all that stuff. But like everywhere else, you need to know your market, and and, and it's increasingly. Why I wouldn't hesitate to build a factory in Namibia because it, you know, it, it presents all the right uh, elements. You know, my ore is there. I, I move it next door. I can, I can actually. I've got relatively cheap electricity, and the Namibian people benefit. And Namibia government got more taxes, and it promotes stability going on and on, and it just changes the sort of the the paternalistic dynamic that historically we've had. You know, the world is a much more different place today, and I think. And I, to be fair to investors, I think a lot of people get that. It is a process, uh, but I think we're getting we're moving in the right direction. I suppose looking at a, a conclusion, um, how what's the outlook for, obviously, you're currently the CEO of uh, Ongo Polo Mining and Processing. Um, what is the sort of outlook for the remainder of uh, 2024? Well, 2024 for us is quite an exciting year, I, I, I think. Um, like I said, for the last four years, we've been doing a lot of so-called backroom work, trying to understand our whole body better, trying to understand the market better, trying to recruit the right people, um, and trying to do business in a um, in an ethical, proper way. And not just paying lip service to ESG, but actually trying to see how we can really make that difference uh, because we want to make build a long-term company. And we now have very clear sight to production. Like I think I mentioned earlier, we will um, be. Uh, uh, we'll start pretty hopefully by May, and our initial ambition of getting to a th you know thirty thousand tons um, run rate a year. Uh, that's that's there within within two years. Um, but also we we one of the things I'm excited about is that we're going to go into a lot more exploration in Namibia and in the sub region and try and sort of really develop uh, a couple of assets. Namibia, in my view, probably has as much proper potential as Zambia. And so we, we but it's all this is hugely underexplored. So in terms of blue skies, in terms of future, that's what we're going to focus on as well. Yeah. And lastly, just wonder if there's anything else that you want to uh, tell our audience, our audience, uh, um, mainly from the mining industry, from all over the world, um, a lot from Africa, various parts of Africa. Um, is there anything else that you would like to uh, add as a conclusion? Um, no, and, and, and Rob, thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to speak to your audience. Um, and if they're in Africa, they, they understand, you know, Africa is, um, mining is is a stubborn girlfriend where you've got to keep, <laughs> you've got to keep going. Um, and I think with the EV space and the change in terms of like um, a lot of comp companies now trying to actually do the right thing in terms of updating their rules and everything else, um, I think the African mining future is, is positive. I mean, obviously, the challenges, industrial challenges in places like South Africa that need to be managed through. But I think the only way you do it is obviously look for companies that actually believe in working with their host communities and the government in the right way, in a transparent way. And that is the, in terms of medium to long term, that's where you get real value. John, really appreciate your time. Thank you for giving us a, uh, an update on the company, but also giving a, a, a good picture of mining in uh, the Nibia. And I know from, uh, I probably don't want to do uh, podcasts with um, with companies that are mining in Nibia. And I think it is very undervalued. Um, and apparently it's a, it's a great place to, to to go within Africa. So uh, really appreciate you uh, giving us an update on the, on the country. Um, if our audience wants to reach out to you, if they want to follow your story, um, how can they go about doing that? What social media channels are you on so people can follow follow your story? Well, we, we um, well, um, Vasya will send you because we're about to launch our our, our website, and she 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 will get that to you. And uh, and I hope that you invite me again after we start production to tell you how it's going. 
certainly more than welcome to come on the podcast later this year or next year when, when production when production goes more than welcome just obviously reach out to me and we can uh, get you back on brilliant thank you so much for your time Rob no worries thank you and all the best for 2024 thank you very much bye bye yeah thank you hope you enjoyed that episode um, as always appreciate your continued support please keep sharing this episode too far and wide um, especially with all my African listeners please Please share this episode to all your friends and family, people outside of the mining industry. Um, as John's alluded to, obviously copper is needed for the, the electrification that we're moving into. Um, so this is a, a good episode to, to maybe show people that are outside of the mining industry um, a little bit about what we do. So as always, appreciate your continued support. And until next time, happy mining. Thank you for listening. Remember to reach out to Rob via the show notes and be sure to subscribe and leave a review. Until next time, happy mining, helping each other to improve the mining industry.